Hi everyone, thanks for joining us on today's Graduate Ambitions uh, podcast session. As always, we are here to help you hear from employers on the different opportunities that they've got available for early careers. And I'm Lisa Brennan, the Managing Director of Strategic Ambitions, and I'm joined by Anya Pini of the Graduate Ambitions team with me today. And our guests today are from Dentons, and we're joined by Rosie Buckley and Imogen Wilkinson. So I'm going to hand you over to them to let them quickly introduce themselves before we get into all of the detail about the amazing opportunities that they've got. I'll hand over to Rosie first. Okay, thanks Lisa. Yeah, so my name is Rosie. Um, I look after early careers at Denton, so that means um, recruitment for our um, different early careers opportunities, so that's um, from apprentices to school leavers through to vacation schemes and training contracts for students at university and graduates. And I'll pass over to Imogen. Yeah, so um, I'm Imogen. I am a trainee at Denton's. I've just started my first seat a couple of months ago, and before that I did a vacation scheme. So yeah, I've got a few experiences of the different things Rosie spoke about there. Well, it sounds like we've got the right people here to, to share all the information with us today. Um, so let's hear a bit about Dentons to start off with. Um, you know, what what is Dentons? What is it like to work there? Tell us a bit about the, the legal firm and the specialist and services that you guys offer. Yeah, um, good question. It's hard to know where to start with that one, but I think um, a summary you'll often hear about Denton's is that we're the world's largest law firm. Um, so we are a commercial law firm and we have offices all, all over the globe. Um, so in the UK, which is sort of our region, we have them across Edinburgh, Glasgow, London and Milton Keynes. But across the world, you can basically pick any country on the map and you'll probably find a Denton's um, office. Um, so a, a really big firm. And I think something that makes us slightly different in terms of our international approach is that we are something called polycentric, which you'll probably only hear in relation to Denton's, but it means we don't have a head office. So each of our regions um, is, is led by, by the region. We work um, collaboratively, collaboratively across all of our offices, but we don't have one guiding head office, which does make us um, a little bit different. Um, and I said we're a commercial law firm, we're full service in terms of our commercial offering. So we'll hopefully discuss some of our practice areas over the day, um, but everything from corporate to banking, technology law, all with generally commercial clients. Hey, Majin, I don't know if you wanted to speak a bit about sort of what drew you to Denton's and, and what you do in your team. Yeah, so um, I am sitting in competition law. Um, as Rosie said, it's with a sort of commercial focus. Um, and yeah, I mean, it is a huge firm, which I guess is it was really appealing to me when I was applying but I have been surprised even even though I knew that since I started about how much collaboration there is between the different offices I mean in um, countries all over the world that we're liaising with on a on a day-to-day -day basis it's, it's really cool it's really exciting um, but also within the within the UK my team is split between Scotland and London so I'm working really closely with people in Edinburgh and Glasgow and then the trainees that I have are in my intake we're also split across those four offices but we all again like work really closely together and know each other well so it's, it's a really nice big but sort of collaborative environment yeah and I think that's a really it's really important especially now everything is so virtual anyway to to, to be able to do that and and to have that collaboration globally um across so many offices um but but tell us a bit more about the culture um at Denton's you know what what's it like to work there yeah. so I click off again Imogen um <laughs> so one of the good things about the way we've grown is that each office does have a unique culture um so um for example in Scotland we actually merged with another firm probably about five years ago now so we've retained a lot of that culture um generally Milton Keynes used to have a slightly different atmosphere than than London um so each office has its little quirks and that's the same across the the globe but there are a few things that are consistent and are values that go across all our offices um so they are um let's see if I can remember these now um stronger together so we work better as a team we work better collaboratively as you mentioned um Imogen that's really important um we're here to win um so we're very ambitious um and and sort of forward looking 
I can't remember the tagline for the other one, but we're very innovative and, and sort of always pushing um, to change things and challenge the status quo as well. So there's a number of values that go across um, the firm and all our offices, but then each office has a little bit of a unique culture as well. But Imogen, I don't know how you, how you found the culture um, in your time. Yes, yeah, so I'm in the London office. And um, yeah, as you say, I think, as, as I mentioned, it is collaborative. But as you mentioned, it is, it's really ambitious. It's very exciting and like um, vibrant place to work. And, you know, surrounded by really smart people doing really cool work, really exciting deals and things like that. So it is, I mean, it's, it's, it's very nice and friendly, but at the same time, people are driving forward. You really feel that. And, and we're all encouraged to get involved in that from the very start. So it's, yeah, very exciting um, environment to be part of. Mm. It's great hearing about the culture of the company. And I know that within the company, um, equality and diversity are very important to you. And I was just wondering how you incorporate that in the day to days. How do you incorporate that in the ways you work? That's a really good question. Yeah, it's really important um, to us and luckily to uh, a lot of firms at the moment, which is great. Um, we have a couple of kind of approaches to inclusion and diversity. So firstly, it's at the recruitment stage. So we want to make sure we are, um, our, our opportunities are inclusive, open to lots of different, um, for me, students, for early careers across um, across all our opportunities, but then also that the processes are inclusive um, and that we're reaching a really diverse group of students. So we work uh, with a number of organisations who help make sure that we're reaching diverse students. We always review our processes, make sure we've got diverse panels of people and just making sure that the, the opportunities, as I said, are all sort of inclusive. So that's the recruitment side of things. And then obviously once people are in the firm, it's making sure people can be themselves in the office. It's not enough just to have a diverse cohort. You want to make sure people can, can be themselves, whatever that means in the office. So we have a few different initiatives. We've got our network. So they are groups of people who either identify as being part of the group or as an ally. So we have um, GLOW, which is our LGBTQ plus network, uh, our Black Professionals Network, uh, Fusion, which is our Asian Professionals, Parents and Carers, and Inspire, which is our Gender Equality Network. So they are, are really sort of powerful in the firm for raising issues that are important to them. They run events, um, they run sort of workshops and, and webinars, they work with clients um, and do a lot of outreach as well. So they are a really good kind of guiding force for inclusion. Um, and we also have a dedicated inclusion team as well who, who oversee everything and make sure that we're, we're on the right track. And I think, you know, no law firm is probably where they should be in terms of inclusion and diversity, but, you know, making really good strides and having some really honest conversations, which I think is, is really important. So we actually had a talk today um, led by the Inspire um, Network around the menopause, which typically might not be a topic that would be discussed in the workplace, but, and, you know, it impacts a huge amount of people who, who we work with. So really important conversations to, to have. Um, Image, I don't know if you've come across any of the networks. You've only been at the firm a couple of months. So. Yeah, I mean, it's a, I mean, the networks, there's always things that I'm being um, invited to and interesting talks, as you mentioned earlier, things that, you know, we can get involved in. And it, it is really like a proactive the networks seem really proactive and there's a lot of information out there. Um, I've not, as you say, been here that long, so I've not had a huge experience of that, but just on a more sort of um, like culture level, it's a very open place. People are really, um, as a trainee, really nurturing, checking you're okay, making sure that everything's in place so that you can, you can succeed. I've found that just in my short time. And yeah, it's a very like open and caring environment as well. I feel like it is super important to have those conversations and have the ability to have those come feel confident confident enough and comfortable enough to have those conversations I think it's very important and we're talking about um, recruiting and um, what sort of roles are you recruiting for at the moment what sort of early career roles are you going for yeah of course we have two main streams so um, sister apprenticeships are the first stream and perhaps not as well known as sort of our graduate opportunities so they are for anyone who's a school leaver um, who hasn't um, commenced a degree so it doesn't have to be someone who's just finished the A-levels you know they could have had another career but as long as they haven't had done an undergraduate degree um, it's a six-year program so it's combining your university studies and working together so you work um, four days a week and then you're at university every Monday um, and over those six years, you um, finish your degree, um, which is fully funded by the firm. Um, and you also, at the end of it, become a qualified solicitor. So it sort of wraps up the traditional route of university, then a training contract all up in, in one. Um, really beneficial for students who learn better by sort of working 
or who don't want to get into a huge amount of debt at university and they want to just get into the workforce straight away. Um, and then the other stream is for university students and graduates. Um, so we have two main opportunities there. So vacation schemes, which are um, they're usually two weeks. Obviously, the last couple of years they've been virtual, so slightly different, but fingers crossed this year they'll be in person. Um, and they're a chance to get to know the firm, um, learn about our different areas, meet our people. Um, and if you attend a vacation scheme, you're automatically assessed for our training contracts, which are our graduate scheme. Um, and that's the two year program that Imogen's on at the moment. And Imogen, you did a vacation scheme, didn't you? Yeah, I did a vacation scheme last summer, so that was 2020. Um, and as you say, it was virtual. It was a slightly extraordinary year in, <laughs> in many ways. Um, but yeah, the vacation scheme, um, as Rosie said, is a really good way to get to know the firm, get to know the culture, maybe meet some people, um, have some discussions about maybe the areas of law you're interested in, or even if law is, you know, what you want to do, it's a really good way to, to work it out. Um, you can, yeah, you meet other other young people uh, like you who hopefully, if all goes well, you end up in your training contract with as well. So that was, um, yeah, a really great experience. I sat in two different departments, so got experiences of those. And yeah, as I say, met different people, had had good um, experiences on those. Um, and then, yeah, as you said, the training contracts, which I have just started to your program and I'm going to sit in four different departments for six months each over the next two years. So um, it's not like you need to make any decisions straight away. You'll have a really broad experience and yeah, I think it's a really good program. Yeah, and the same is for our apprentices as well. They do eight seats actually because obviously it's a longer program so they don't have to know what they want to do at the beginning which I think when you're 17, 18 is, is not usual to know exactly what you want to do. Um, and at the end of both the training contract and the sister apprenticeship program, when you become a qualified sister, we aim to retain people as an associate, which is the next step um, in terms of a career in law. So we try and retain those people um, for the longer careers with us as well. I mean, I think there are um, some amazing opportunities. And I think it's really refreshing that you've got both of those routes because actually that... Uh, opens it up again, you know, in terms of inclusivity to a career and, and law to so many more people that perhaps would have thought you just have to go to uni straight from school to, to achieve that. Um, so what what are the kind of uh, the types of students that you're looking to apply, you know, what kind of criteria do you have for the roles that you've just told us about? Yeah, of course. So I think one misconception, I think, is that you have to have studied law and you don't. Um, you could study um, anything you want, either at your A-levels or at university and still become a solicitor. Um, so you don't have to have known, you know, for years that this is the path that you, you want to follow. Um, but what you do have to have by the time you apply is an understanding and a very high level understanding of what a commercial solicitor does. Um, so there's lots of resources online. Um, lots of virtual events. One of the good things about the pandemic is there's lots of opportunities like this podcast um, to learn a little bit more. Um, and that's really all we ask for. So we don't expect you to have um, work experience. It's very difficult to get commercial work experience. We actually have a virtual work experience program, which is open access. So if anyone is interested in getting a bit of experience, that can be a good starting place. Um, but particularly for our internships um, and our apprentices, we don't expect there to be any sort of transferable legal experience. So don't let that put you off. Um, and then in terms of grades for um, both, we look for A, B, B at A level. Um, and then for those looking for the student, the university student roles, it's a 2-1 or working towards that at university. Um, with a caveat that we look at every single application form. So we never automatically screen people out. So um, we look at every form and, and look at it in context. We work with a contextual recruitment system, which tells us a bit more background about sort of your grades and the situation in which you've achieved them. And we also consider things like extenuating circumstances. So I always recommend with any firm you're applying to, if you don't hit the benchmark, maybe email their early careers team or their graduate recruitment team, and they'll be able to advise you whether it's worth putting in an application um, anyway. But Imogen, I don't know if you sort of have any thoughts on, on what else we look for, if there's any common themes between our trainees at all. Gosh, that's, that's an interesting <laughs> question. Um... I would say my experience of um, the trainees I've met, both in my co cohort and further up the firm, um, the only thing that really seems to unite them, as cliched as this is, is like a really good attitude. 
um, people, everyone's very different, lots of different experiences, people who studied law, people who didn't. I also have an, worked with an apprentice in my team who obviously hasn't been to university. And so people are coming from lots of different places in terms of their experience, also from all over the world. I couldn't pinpoint anything other than that, you know, everyone's been a nice bunch and is just keen to get involved and learn. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I think just, yeah, a good attitude. And as Rosie said, show that you've done your research, your grades are fine and well, but um, I think, yeah, really research what the job is and make mm -hmm. sure you know that you're in the right place because there are so many different careers, even within law. So just make sure you, you yeah, if you're applying to Denton's, then no brush up on your commercial awareness and things like that. Yeah, and there's lots of useful resources to, to do that. So as I said, lots of virtual internships. Um, we also have on our, if you do our experience centres programme, a list of sort of podcasts and things you can sign up to and news articles um, to help build that commercial awareness as well. Yeah, I've actually seen um, some of the posts for, for your podcasts and, and resources. I think they're really super helpful for the, the candidates in terms of that preparation because it is a bit like where do you start and how do you know that you're um, you know focusing on the right things for your applications um, and, and I was wondering as you were talking there because one of the uh, the hashtags that you use is um, challengers accepted so if, if you were to say like you know challengers accepted what does that that mean in terms of you know the types of candidates that you're looking for? Yeah, so that stems from us as a firm being um, a challenger firm. So always trying to look at things differently and, and not just go with the sort of status quo. And that's what we look for in candidates as well. So people who are driven to push themselves and be proactive um, and have a go at things. You know, it's fine to, to fail at something the first time, but having a go at things and being enthusiastic about um, developing. We don't expect anyone to be a finished product when they start with it or probably when they end their graduate program either but we want people who are really keen to try and, and innovate and, and push themselves. So we ask a few questions in our application process about things like a challenge that you've overcome um, and what are your interests outside of your studies. And that's where we're looking to see that people are um, proactive and they are um, able to overcome obstacles and, and really sort of show that commitment and, and drive, whether that's in their personal life, volunteering, work experience, hobbies, anything like that. And that's really interesting to hear that um, because it probably kind of ties quite nicely on to my next question where it's just around about the job roles themselves, you know, so if this is, um, you know, the, the types of roles you're offering, um, you know, and, and you've, you're looking for individuals to come in and, and be part of that um, challenge, <laughs> then, mm -hmm. you know, what, what would they be doing on a day-to-day -day basis? What, what Kind yeah. of activities, tasks, who would they be working with, etc. So it changes hugely, I think, depending on what department or as we call them practice area that you're in. Um Imogen, you're in competition, that's right, isn't it? So what sort of things are you doing on the day to day? So it is a, a huge mix. Um gosh, <laughs> you put me on the spot. I should be able to tell you what I'm doing. A lot of um it's not like you're not as a trainee, your role isn't actually important. Like you're really a, a key sort of cog in the wheel on, on the matters that your department's working on. Um, so it might seem sometimes fairly low level, but um, I'm just trying to think of a good example. We're working on um, a case at the moment, which is uh, uh, re involves um, reporting to the Competition Markets Authority. And I've been really involved in like drafting that correspondence and going back to sort of documents and really, I mean, it goes to my supervisor, it gets checked, it's a whole process, but I've been like from the very beginning thrown straight in to sort of really like proper work. <laughs> um, and then there are, you know, lots of different things. So that's like some drafting skills. Also a lot of um, proofreading. We have to do, um, yeah, for, they're, they were publishing a chapter in my department. So we were like, can you check for updates? It's really, you know, not, um, how to say it's, it's not sort of low level it's you know you're really thrown in from the start and it's just a huge variety of tasks no two days have looked the same for me so far um we're really encouraged um just going back to what rosie was saying before to sort of um contribute in sort of the thinking and 
challenging the way things are done. So we're having to give training updates on sort of the, the most recent developments in our practice area. Um, we're working on innovation projects to make things more efficient. So like really embracing technology, which I think is a really good way um, without um, <laughs> being condescending, but it's when there's sort of younger people in who are maybe a bit more tech savvy, the firm wants to sort of harness that to make the old ways of doing things work better. So all of those things, it's, it's just a huge variety of legal work and yeah, just more general sort of project management type things. Mm. And with any successful candidates like yourself, Imogen, what are some extra ways that you could get involved and gain some extra experience um, within the company? Um, so, do you, sorry, just to clarify, do you mean before you are like doing the vacation scheme or something like that? Are you just, as um, if you've just been accepted, you're a successful candidate, what are some extra ways that you could sort of put yourself forward, get more involved, gain some extra work experience, extra experience within the company? So um, as soon as I had like been given my offer, uh, the firm are really proactive about keeping in touch with you because I had to go in and do another year of study. Um, so there are lots of ways they get us involved um, putting us in touch with current trainees um, so we can sort of discuss all sorts of things about working at the firm with them, what it's going to be like. Um, they arrange, we did a lot of it virtually, as I say, because of the timing, but um, there are, yeah, lots of ways to reach out and sort of, yeah, just be in touch with people who are already there. The communication is really good. Um, we all were encouraged to be in touch with one another. So it's just, yeah, lo lots of ways between your offer and the firm to sort of get involved sooner. And then once you start the training contract or the apprenticeship as well, um, you've obviously got your work in your seat and depending on what's going on, that can take uh, most of your time. But we also have a few things you can do with the firm. Um, pro bono is something we really encourage our trainees to do. So that is um, working um, for, for free, essentially uh, offering free legal advice. So that could be anything. We work closely with the National Centre for Domestic Violence. We also have some free legal clinics to support people who need legal advice. Um, so that's a great way for trainees to try something outside of their seat. Um, and then obviously getting involved with those networks I mentioned, um, social committees, we have um, sports teams and book clubs and things like that. So there are things to do outside of kind of the day to day of your role as well, if you have sort of uh, the inclination and the capacity as well, for sure. Mm, and how do candidates apply? What does your uh, recruitment process look like? Yeah, so quite similar for, for all opportunities in that it starts with an application form. So no cover letter or CV, which I personally like, I hate a cover letter. Yeah. Um, a, a application form gives you a bit more structure. Um, and that is looking at your grades, your work experience, but then really at kind of um, long answer questions, again, as I mentioned earlier, around the challenge you've overcome, and then why law and why Denton. And what we're looking for there is that people have done their research um, and understand sort of what makes us different. And as I said before, what a commercial solicitor does. Um, then we have um, a Watson Glazer test, which is a critical thinking test. Um, my best advice for that is we have a practice one on our, our website. Um, so just practice as much as you can, lots of ones out there for free. Um, and then we have interviews and assessment centers. That's when you meet with our teams and our lawyers. Um, and again, as I said before, we're not expecting anyone to know everything in those sessions. You know, knowing legal jargon, things like that, that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for things like problem solving skills, um, an understanding of the commercial world quite quite broadly, not too specific, um, and that real motivation. So we will dig more into sort of motivation um, and, and why law, why Denton, and the sort of skills that will make someone a successful sister. So they're probably common sense things, but, you know, communication, collaboration, um, the ability to sort of adapt and, and show resilience when challenged, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Julie. Um, good. When when it comes to your um, application itself, is it that the individuals have to complete that all in one session or can they complete part and save it and go back and, and complete the rest at another time? Yeah, so for the application form, they can come back to it. So um, for our vacation schemes, the applications are open now until January 3rd, so plenty of time. Uh, we recruit on a rolling basis. That's a term you might hear for different firms and basically that means we recruit as applications come in 
So what that means is try and get your application in a little bit early. It doesn't have to be when they open, but in the first sort of two or three months, um, we still get probably around 60% at 11.59 on the day of the deadline. Um, so don't worry too much, but if you can, try and submit it a little bit earlier. Um, but you can absolutely go into it, um, draft your answer, and then come back. And we'd recommend doing that and having a friend, a career service member, a family member reading through your application before you actually press submit. Um, and then the same for apprentices, except they close February 19th, so a little bit longer for those ones to come in. Yeah, good. And, and actually that echoes a lot of the advice that we give um, to the students and graduates that we work with as well, you know, um, doing that preparation, getting someone to review it and actually planning it in so that you can get it in ahead of the deadline whilst you're working around about all the other things you're juggling from your studies to your personal life and and so on um, and you mentioned there also um, you kind of touched on the selection process there but you mentioned um, assessment centre and I think that's probably a fairly familiar term that most people um, that will be applying for these roles will be aware of but assessment centres can look different from one company to another so what kind of activities would that involve at Denton's? Yeah, maybe if I give an overview and then imagine you can sort of talk from your perspective being on the other side. Um, <laughs> yeah. So we, ours has two main activities. So it has a, a written exercise and role play as one activity. And that is where you're given a pack of information and you're asked to produce something based on that pack of information. Um, so again, we're not expecting people to have prior knowledge. The information is all in the pack, but it's about understanding what's relevant, um, problem solving and understanding, uh, you know, it could be news articles or data and being able to apply it to a problem. So a lot of that's about being practical, using your common sense, your problem solving skills um, and things like that. Um, so that's the, the first side of ours. And then the second side is a case study. Um, and that is um, another scenario. It's a little bit more legal focused, but not in that we need people to understand all the key terms and the ins and outs. But to have a good overview of our practice areas, what each of them means, um, which you can find on our website and things like that, um, and how they might work together with a client. And again, it's problem solving um, and, and, and thinking on your feet as well. Um, I guess my advice for the both of them is take your time. Um, there are time limits, so it's very easy to rush in. But I always say to candidates, take a couple of minutes at the beginning to plan what you want to do, and then leave some time at the end to check your work. Um, the case study is actually face to face. It's not a written exercise. Um, but again, take your time. It's fine to pause and say, can I have a minute to think about that? Or would you mind clarifying? Uh, make some notes as you go. So very easy when you're nervous, I think, to rush into an answer. But if you if you can just take a pause, a, a pause always feels longer to you than it does to the other people um, and try and collect your thoughts. Um, but as I said before, they are commercial exercises. They are not technical. We're not expecting people to know everything. Um, but we are looking for some of those transferable skills. But Imogen, I don't know if that matches up to, to your experience. Yeah, I think definitely. I actually, I wouldn't have said this when I was doing it, but with hindsight, it's actually quite an enjoyable thing. Um, the exercises are quite interesting. I had one, um, one on sort of cars. So as Rosie said, you're not expected to know about the subject area. I don't know anything about cars or anything like that, but it's how you can digest and then... Um, sort of formulate a coherent answer in the in the written exercise. Um, I would also say I don't know if um, Rosie would agree, but I got the sense when I was doing it that there wasn't a correct answer. So mm -hmm. don't assume that you're you're getting it wrong. You need to sort of look at what you have in front of you and then present an argument. And and when I had to present that to um, I think it was associates in my assessment center they they push back on you and that's the whole I suppose that's part of it it's how do you respond to that and can you back up what you've suggested and yeah as I say you've got this pack of information so you just need to pick out the bits that support your argument and be able to present those um I think Rosie was mentioning you know keep calm don't don't get in a big rush and you know if there was something I think I remember in mind they they asked me something and I couldn't find it and I said oh you know I just said could I just have a minute to look for it and then I found it and so you know these people are not trying people want you to succeed mm -hmm. they're not trying to sort of trip you up so if you just keep keep calm take your time and like work methodically yeah. 
think that's really sound advice actually um because it's one of the most unnatural things that you do really go into a, an interview or assessment center situation um a lot of it's unfamiliar on un, you don't know what to expect so being, i think that's really helpful advice that you you've offered there imogen um for, for candidates that might need some accommodations um, to exercises and so on, um, you know, how, how do they go about doing, doing that, letting you know they need that support in your process? Yeah, of course. So on our form, it says an opportunity to flag that right at the beginning if you do require any support. Um, you can put what support you require or you can just ask the team to give you a call if you'd rather discuss it in person. That's absolutely fine. Um, and, and that can be anything from extra time on tests. Some people need a uh, different version of the form, maybe a different font size. Um, and then on the assessment day, again, they might need extra time to review information. Um, and I've never met a graduate recruitment team who wouldn't accommodate those things. Sometimes they need evidence. So, you know, a letter from your university um, or a letter that you use for extra time in exams. Um, but, but firms want, again, want you to do well. No one's trying to trip you up. So I always just think be as honest as you can um, about all the accommodations that you need and firms will, will help you make them um, and at each stage if you're worried or you're not sure what adjustments need to be made then just talk to the graduate recruitment team they've probably come across something similar before so they'll be able to, to help you with that as well. Excellent um, and I think as well when it comes to um, the successful candidates that, you, that, that you're going to be taking on for both of um, those routes what, what can they expect in terms of development? I mean, you've mentioned about the, the different numbers of seats, you know, four for the, those in a training contract and eight for those on the apprenticeship route. But what, what other developmental solutions and support are there um, for those individuals? Yeah, of course. So we um, recently modernised our training contract. So we were looking at what we think a future lawyer needs to be successful and building that in. Um, so we have three sort of key strands on top of the traditional training contract, which is innovation, which starts actually before people join us, they, they do some work on that. And then each seat, they do an innovation project, as Imogen was mentioning. Um, we're also doing a project management um, uh, qualification as part of our training contract now. Um, and then also resilience, so all around sort of mental well-being. Um, and, and that resilience that um, anyone needs in sort of a demanding career, making sure that you're managing your, your mental health and aware of the impact. Um, so they're the sort of new things we've built in. On top of that, we do an induction. So before you actually get to your first seat, it's an induction to go over all sorts of things. So the technology you'll be using, some of the key skills that you'll need to develop, um, making sure you're really ready to get started. Um, and then each seat will have seat-specific training. So if you're on a banking seat, you'll do some banking training. Um, and technology, you'll do technology training. Um, and then on top of that, uh, lots of soft skill training sessions. So some mandatory for all trainees, lots of things that are sort of opt-in. We actually have, um, it's almost like a Netflix of training courses. You can just kind of type in what you want um, and there will be some sort of pre-recorded training sessions or ones that you can book into. Um, so ones that are mandatory and that we encourage everyone to do and then a bit of sort of thinking about what would be helpful for you and, and doing that. Um, and then just to, to wrap that up before I pass to you, Imogen, in terms of day-to-day -day support, everybody has a supervisor. So that's kind of a dedicated person who is your go-to um, for questions. Um, we have a dedicated HR person for all of our trainees and apprentices who they can go to with questions that don't relate to work. Um, and then also, I think the trainee cohort all support each other quite a lot as well. Um, Imogen, I spoke a lot there, but you're actually <laughs> in the training contract. So how have you found development? Yeah, um Really, really, as Rosie said, there's just so much um, on offer. Um, my induction was still quite recent, and that was a really, really helpful. I mean, it's quite full on. It's two weeks of um, training, um, but it's a really, really helpful way so that you can sort of hit the ground running in your first seat. Um, so, yeah, all sorts of things covered there. Um, when I started in competition, we had lectures from various different members of the team, and that's a really nice way to sort of settle in um, just and get get to know your practice area because it is you know when you change it is a bit of a sort of um gear change I suppose between departments um but yeah just to sort of get to grips with the the key things you need to know before you start it's really interesting to hear from people who've been doing this job and have you know real first-hand experience of really interesting work in the area 
um, and more generally, like um, Rosie was saying, there's the sort of catalogue of courses. There are things that I've struggled with, like I wasn't brilliant on Excel. And I just looked it up and then I took like an hour course. So it's just there. I mean, I really, I, I, there's so much available on that front. Um, I don't think there's anything the firm probably wouldn't offer. And I also get the sense that like, if there was something I could bring it up and it seemed like it would be a value, they definitely support me doing it because as I said, like they want us to succeed, it makes the, makes the firm better. Is there any advice that you'd give anyone wanting to apply or thinking of applying or something that you wish you knew before? Um, yeah, I think, you know, I kind of probably touched on a few of those things, but um, I think I often thought in application forms or interviews that people are trying to trip you up and it's not like that. People just want, you know, you to be able to, to like demonstrate your best and for you to succeed so you know do your research definitely do your research into the role of a commercial solicitor into the firm um you're not I mean it is a very competitive process I think everyone knows that so make sure that you know what you're what you're applying for and who you're applying for but um yeah don't um I, yeah I would say don't get too anxious about it and try to just be yourself and deliver your best on the day it's a really really open firm from that point of view and you know I've just found it a very supportive and encouraging experience from start to finish so do your research by all means but don't get too stressed and what about you Rosie is there any advice that you're looking for um, that you can offer even that you're looking for things perhaps slightly differently from an HR perspective from the yeah um oh my headphones just come out um I think um there is no sort of one person that, that any firm is looking for there's no Denton's training as Imogen was saying a huge range of people you know um career changes apprentices trainees uh, loads of different people from different backgrounds so don't try and fit into the mold of what you maybe think a commercial system looks like. I think we all know what uh, a traditional commercial system might look like in our minds, but that's not the case. And we do really do want to get to know you. So whenever you're talking about why law, why the firm, your motivations, always link it back to you and, and be genuine. So, you know, if you're saying you want to work for an innovative firm or a diverse firm, why, why is that? How have your experience sort of shaped that? So always be personal um and you know we actually ask you about your extracurriculars we don't expect that to be that you love reading the financial times every day we really do want to hear what what your interests are um so so be yourself and and make it really personal um because that's what we're trying to do is sort of build a picture of, of who you are so important to keep that in mind for sure yeah really really um interesting to hear that because i think so many um students have got this idea that there is a mold out there of some perfect graduate that each company is looking for and striving to achieve that is um, really difficult and <laughs> um, because it means that you can't really be yourself so I think um, that's great advice that, that you both offered there and um, I I think it's really refreshing actually to hear everything that you've spoken about today about Denton's and you know how they have that that whole aspect of being able to review your training contract and add in those extra elements as well you know this is what you're looking for for the future support in um the development more holistically and not just from the technical legal aspects of it i think it's got so much to offer um those candidates so so yeah, I mean, for, for all of you um, students out there who are interested in applying for the Denton's um, schemes, either the, um, the training contract route uh, or the apprenticeship route, we will put in the description below the website um, link so that you can go on there, you can access the information and all the additional resources that, that Rosie's mentioned as well, as well as the applications um, themselves. The vacancies do have slightly different um, kind of timelines around about them. So the vacation schemes are open 
um, now they've been open since um, earlier this month in October to um, the 3rd of January. Apprenticeships are also open right now um, until the February the 19th next year and training contracts open on the 1st of December um, for applications and that closes on the 30th of June next year. Now again we'll put all those um, dates below for you um, and you know we will also as I said we can put the LinkedIn links in uh, there as well for everyone that's been on um, this session today so at least if you need to reach out to anyone to ask advice or support you can connect in with with us on linkedin and do that um but i know for for dentons as well there will be routes to reach out to contacts on on the website and through the application process so um we'll get that information on there and all of our social information will be on there as well so you can like and subscribe for any future sessions that you want to hear and um, that will help support you with your graduate success with your early career applications um and yeah if you want to hear more from graduate ambitions that will come directly to you so thank you so much um, to both of you for your time this afternoon it's been really great to hear Denton's brought to life yeah thank you so much for having us yeah, thank you it was lovely <laughs> and thanks Anya as well for <laughs> for being here to, to help um you know with with all of the questioning <laughs> <laughs> okay speak to you all soon thanks bye